Well, Merry Christmas, First Church. So glad you guys are joining us for our Christmas Eve services, whether you're online or you're on site. My name's Chad, and if you can't tell, we are excited to celebrate Christmas because we believe Jesus' birth forever changed the world. So if you're excited to be here, would you let our online families watching right now know that you're excited? Welcome them in. Yeah. I was just told we have Sarah from Austin, Texas joining us, and I know we have others as well. We're so glad our online family is with us for Christmas Eve also. And as we begin, I just want to make a statement, and it's this. I don't know what you asked for this Christmas, but I do know one thing. I know what God wants to give you, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. One of my favorite parts of this season is watching my kids open up their gifts because you never know how they're going to respond. And I found this video not too long ago of a little boy who was opening up a card that his grandpa gave him, and his reaction is classic. Take a look at this video. Binoculars. Some outdoor gear. What? What is that? Huh? Yeah, note. Merry Christmas note. <laughs> <laughs> they never just notes on Christmas, are they? <laughs> well, since it's Christmas, I better open it like a present. Yeah, here, let me help you with it. I'm afraid you might say the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, it's a card. Christmas card. There you go. There you go. Yeah, it's got my favorite animal on it. <gasps> $50! <laughs> <laughs> and I thought you were a cheap. <laughs> you better give him a hug for that. That was mean, Ryan. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that video for a couple of reasons. One, because it's funny, but two, because I think it illustrates a pretty important life truth. Just as a note isn't always a note on Christmas, a lot of times in life, Things are not always as they seem. And I believe that's one of the big messages of Christmas. And we're going to see that as we study together Matthew chapter 2 tonight. See, Matthew picks up in the Christmas narrative about a year, year and a half after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. See, after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph decide to stay there. They weren't from Bethlehem. They were originally from the town of Nazareth. But apparently, Mary and Joseph decide that Joseph can do his carpentry work, work there in Bethlehem just as well as he could in Nazareth. And so they decide to stay. A year and a half or so passes, and that's where Matthew picks up the story. And let's read and see what happens. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, in this day and age, no one would have debated who was in charge in this region. We saw that Herod is mentioned in this passage. Jesus, when he was born, he was placed in a manger. But King Herod, he ruled from a throne. Jesus had a manger, Herod had a throne. That's how everyone saw the world, and no one would have argued about that. And honestly, today, that's how some people still see the world. Oh, we give Jesus a few days every year where we celebrate his birth, but then the holiday passes. We have to get back in the real world, and we have to deal with the real powers at be. But I think the Christmas message reminds us that things are not always as they seem. Many of you will recognize the name Barbara Bush. She was first lady of the United States about 30 years ago. And she was able to claim when she was alive that she was both the mother of a president and the wife of another president. That's pretty cool. Only two ladies in history can make that claim. But what's interesting is soon after her son, George W. Bush, was elected president, he and his wife, Laura, came to visit his parents who were living in Houston at the time. And the first morning that they were there, George W. Bush came down to get a cup of coffee. His parents were already awake. They were drinking their coffee. And he walked into the living room where they were, sat down on the couch, and there George W. Bush put his feet up on the coffee table. And as soon as he did, his mother, Barbara, said, George, get your feet off my coffee table. Well, as soon as she said that, her husband responded, 
Barbara, for goodness sakes, he is the president of the United States. And Barbara then responded, I don't care. I'm his mother. That's my coffee table, and he's going to put his feet down. And sure enough, the president of the United States put his feet down. See, sometimes the people who we think are in charge really aren't. Things aren't always as they seem. And I believe that's what's going on at the time when Jesus was born. See, everybody would have thought that Herod was in charge of this region. But heaven had a different perspective. And there were a few people who also had heaven's perspective. We're introduced to these men called magi. We sometimes refer to them as wise men. And they're different from the other people in the Christmas narrative that have a positive reputation. I mean, most of the people that have a positive reputation in the Christmas narrative, well, they're underprivileged. They're outsiders. They're outcasts. They're Jews who are living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. That's who we typically uh, read about. I mean, think about it. Mary and Joseph and Anna and Simeon and Zechariah and Elizabeth and the shepherds, they're all people who live on the margins of society who were rejected by elite culture. But the Magi, they're different. See, they weren't from Rome. They didn't live under the authority of the Roman Empire. They were from the East, and they served a king in the East. See, contrary to that popular Christmas song, We Three Kings, these guys really weren't kings. They were advisors to kings. They were the guys who were the most educated in the kingdom. They were educated in the arts and sciences and philosophy and religious studies. They were the educated class, and they were the king's council. They were advisors to the king. And because of that, they got to live in the king's palace. They got to eat the king's food. They were able to wear the nicest of clothes. They may not have been kings, but they were, they live like kings as they serve this king in the east. They were not oppressed. They were wealthy. They were prestigious. They were people who had a lot of respect in their own kingdom. And so my question is, why would these guys who seem to have it all leave their comforts to travel almost a thousand miles to see a child who had been born in Bethlehem? Well, perhaps with all their wealth and all their prestige and power and influence, they still hadn't found what they were looking for. To still a line from the band U2. They still hadn't found what they were looking for. Because the Bible teaches that you can achieve everything that this world sees as success, and you can gain all the stuff that this world offers you and still feel very empty, still not have what your soul is longing for. And perhaps these men who had it all knew that they were missing something. And let me ask you, have you ever felt like that? King Solomon did. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, listen to what he says. He was king over Israel. He had power. He had authority. He had wealth. He had everything a man could ask for. And yet he says, but then I looked over everything my hands had done. I saw what I had worked so hard to get, and nothing had any meaning. It was like chasing the wind. Nothing was gained. Solomon says, I had everything and it was so empty. It was so meaningless. See, God intended for us to enjoy life, but if we try to do life without Him, everything that we gain, everything that we possess will end up leaving us feeling empty. Let me ask you, why are you here? Why are you here tonight? Why are you watching this service online? Why are you here? If I can be so bold, I think I know why you're here. It's the same reason why I'm here. We're all looking for the same thing. And if I can be so bold, I know what that is. It can be summed up in one word. It's the word joy. We're all looking for joy. And when I say joy, I'm not talking about 
seasonal holiday cheer. I'm not talking about fleeting happiness that's here one moment and gone the next based on our circumstances. No, I'm talking about an inner sense of peace, contentment, satisfaction that lasts. Something that we have even on our bad days. Something that exists within us that we can't create and manufacture on our own. But it comes from outside of us and yet we're able to possess it. It's joy. Joy that gets us through the tough days. I think we're all looking for that inner sense of peace, contentment, and satisfaction. And the Bible tells us how we can have it. Listen to what David says. David says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. You will show me the path of life. In other words, you will show me how to really live because in your presence is fullness of joy. In other words, you want to have full, complete, lasting joy, joy that brings you inner satisfaction and peace and contentment. You can have it, but you can only have it by doing life with God. That's the secret to living with joy. And I believe that's why the Magi left everything they had to make this dangerous journey because travel in this day and age wasn't easy. It was pretty dangerous. They risked their lives traveling over a thousand miles because they wanted to find something that this world could not offer them. See, what I've learned over time, and I had to learn this the hard way, but it's a truth that changed my life, and it's this. Satisfied people don't chase after satisfaction. They chase after God, and satisfaction finds them. Let me say that again. Satisfied people don't chase after satisfaction. They chase after God, and satisfaction finds them. And that's why they follow the star, and they come to Jerusalem, and they ask King Herod, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, I want you to notice something. These guys weren't looking for a kid. They were looking for a king. And not just any king. Remember, they served a king in the east. They left him behind. They had just encountered another king, King Herod. He wasn't who they were looking for. No, they were looking for someone greater. They were looking for a king from heaven. And how did they know to look for this king? Well, I have a theory. See, 600 years before Jesus was born, there was this godly man named Daniel who was taken captive by a kingdom in the east. And Daniel, even though he was a slave, was extremely intelligent. He was a skilled leader, and he was a faithful, godly man. And he rose to prominence within this foreign kingdom, and the king of this land promoted him. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of its wise men. See, Daniel, almost 600 years before Jesus was born, was not just made second in command of Babylon, he also was put in charge of all the wise men. And I believe he was able to look at these guys and say, hey, I know we have a whole lot of wealth, and I know we have a whole lot of influence, and a whole lot of possession stuff, but you and I both know this stuff will not satisfy us forever. I know what will And it's knowing the one true God. And I believe that Daniel introduced them to the one true God. And he said that that God is going to come to earth one day through the form of his Messiah. And he is going to be a king sent from heaven. And when that king comes, you need to do everything you can to get to him. Because he will bring order to our chaos. He will bring peace to our lives. He will bring joy to our sadness. And so I believe for hundreds of years, these wise men in the East, they waited in great anticipation for this king from heaven. And sure enough, one day, God let them know the king had arrived by sending a star for them to follow. And they followed this star to Jerusalem. And there they saw King Herod, and 
They want to know where the king of the Jews is. And King Herod's like, what are you talking about? I'm the king of the Jews. It's on my business card. What are you talking about? And they're like, no, we want somebody else. And so they consult the religious leaders that were in Jerusalem and said, where is the king from heaven? Where is the Messiah supposed to be born according to prophecy? And they look up prophecy and they find in the book of Micah that it says this. It says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. In other words, the place where the Messiah is going to be born is Bethlehem. And so they travel to Bethlehem to see this one who had been born. Bethlehem was about a five-mile journey from Jerusalem. And so they make that journey to go and see this king that they were looking for. Now, I don't know if you've ever asked the question, why Bethlehem? But I think maybe we should. Because Bethlehem, honestly, was a nothing of a town in this day. In fact, most scholars estimate that Bethlehem probably had a population at this time of less than 150 people. It was small. They didn't have any major resources or industry. It wasn't a crossroads, a major intersection or anything like that. It was just a little, small shepherding community outside of Jerusalem. It was a podunk kind of place, kind of unimpressive, really. In fact, in some historical records, actually in most historical records from that day and age, Bethlehem isn't even listed because it was just so insignificant. And even today, I've been told Bethlehem really is kind of still unimpressive. I have a friend that's been to that region of the world, that area of the world, several times, and he says Bethlehem is the most disappointing city to visit, town to visit, because There's just not a lot there. There's some tourist things, but that's about it. And there's just nothing really memorable about it. In fact, he told me the only thing he really remembered from Bethlehem was this. It had a Stars and Bucks Cafe. Now, that's not Starbucks, okay? That's Stars and Bucks Cafe. Apparently, Bethlehem is so far off the beaten path that Starbucks doesn't even care about copyright infringement, okay? That was the only thing he really remembered from this Very unimpressive town. I mean, the song, Old Little Town of Bethlehem, got it right. It was a little nothing of a town. So why Bethlehem? I think Bethlehem was chosen because it's a picture of God's power on display. You see, here's the thing. God didn't need for his son to be born in Rome. God didn't need for his son to be born in Alexandria. God didn't need for his son to be born in Athens or some other major city in that day. You know why? Because God doesn't need our big to accomplish his mission. He doesn't need the powers of men. He doesn't need the structures that we have established. He doesn't need our resources. He doesn't need our big because he is big enough. And our God is the God that turns the insignificant into something significant. And that's what he did for Bethlehem. And that's what honestly he wants to do for you and me as well. And so these wise men... They come to Bethlehem, and let's read on and see what happens. They went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And that word overjoyed is interesting. In fact, This translation doesn't even capture what these men were feeling. In the original Greek, it literally reads, they rejoiced with extreme mega joy. These wise men were like kids on Christmas morning. I mean, they were excited. They were jumping up and down with joy. They were pumped. And my question is, why? I mean, when they got to Mary and Joseph's house, they probably weren't impressed by that. Mary and Joseph were poor peasants. Their house probably wasn't impressive. I doubt if they were impressed by Bethlehem. Like I said, it was a, kind of a podunk town. 
I'm sure they weren't talking about all the great hotels that were there that they could have stayed in. Or I'm sure they weren't talking about the restaurants that they could dine in. I mean, maybe they did get a cup of coffee at the Stars and Bucks Cafe. I don't know. But I bet that's not why they were overjoyed. There was nothing really impressive about this town. But I think these wise men got excited and were full of joy because they knew with God, things are not always as they seem. There's this restaurant in Tennessee that my family has occasionally visited when we've vacationed there. And when you go to this restaurant, if you order a meal from the kids' menu, they give you something. A little wooden token. I have one right up here with me. Just like this one. And I remember the first time we took Alex there, and he could order off the kids' menu, they gave him this token, and he kind of looked at it like, what is this? You know, what's a kid going to do? This isn't a toy, you know. What is this? And I looked at him, and I said, just wait, buddy. Just wait. So he went and he ate his food. I said, if you eat all your food, I'll tell you what you can do with that token. And he was excited to find out. As soon as he finished his meal, I took him over to this bakery they had within the restaurant. And I said, you can trade in that wooden token for anything you want at this bakery. And they had these huge cookies and brownies and cupcakes and all sorts of cool stuff. And his eyes got about that big. And it took him like an hour to decide what he wanted, you know. And he couldn't wait to hand over his token. Well, a few years passed and we went back. And Addie was now old enough to order off the menu as well, my daughter. And so she ordered a kid's meal and they handed her one of these tokens. And I remember she had the exact same response. She looked at it like, what is this? And before I could even say a word, Alex, her older brother, spoke up and said, just wait. And I believe that's what heaven was declaring in that little town of Bethlehem. You see, it may not have looked like much was going on, but I think the heavens were declaring, just wait. And these wise men, they were listening to the voice of heaven. And heaven was telling them, it may not look like much, but things are not as they seem. What's going on right in front of you is going to change the world. And not just change the world, it's going to change your very lives. This child who you are encountering, he is going to turn the world upside down. History will never be the same because of him. It may not look like much right now, but just wait. You have no idea what's going to happen, what's going to come. And so the Magi were overjoyed, full of joy, because they knew things are not always as they seem. Now, we have a tendency as human beings to idolize the wrong things. And sometimes we idolize people, you know, famous, rich people, celebrities. We have a tendency to do that. And just to prove my point, I would like to do a little game with you. I'm going to put up here on the screen some nicknames and some famous people. And I want you to shout out whose nickname this is. And I bet you'll know most of them, if not all of them, okay? So let's see how we do. Here's the first one. Who's known as the boss? Bruce Springsteen, good. Yeah, somebody last night said Tony Danza. That guy needs to repent, okay? It's definitely not Tony Danza. Yes, it's Bruce, okay? How about this next one? The Rock. Who's The Rock? Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, that one was loud. Okay, yeah, one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood. How about this one? The Duke. Who's known as The Duke? John Wayne. Yeah, there was one older gentleman that told me, he said, that's the one I knew. Okay, yeah, The Duke, John Wayne. How about this nickname? The Man in Black. Johnny Cash, one of my favorite singers. Love Johnny Cash. How about this one? Maybe a little bit more difficult. The Godfather of Soul. James Brown. Yeah, this group over here knew it. Good. Awesome. Okay, how about this one? The King. Elvis, guys, it is Christmas Eve. Jesus is the King. Come on. Man, you, you guys need to repent. Jesus is the King. Now I know who I'm dealing with tonight. Okay, all right. No, the reason why these wise men, these magi were overjoyed is because they knew who they had encountered. They hadn't just encountered a kid. 
They had encountered a king, but not just any king, the king of kings, the one who is going to put an end to all other illegitimate powers that exist in this world. And when they found this king, you know what they did? The text says that they bowed down and worshiped him. You know why? Because our circumstances are going to continue to change in this life. We're going to have bad days. We're going to have good days. But the key to having lasting joy is focusing on the king. The key to having lasting joy is clearly seeing the king of kings. Because when you clearly see him day in and day out, it will change your entire perspective. I think we see this in the text. As we read on, we see it says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, because Herod's mad because he thinks somebody is trying to steal his throne, so he's going to kill some people. After being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, this verse is interesting to me, because I have preached on this passage numerous different times. But for the first time this year when I was studying for this sermon, this hit me. I want you to notice how Herod is addressed here. He's just called Herod. Earlier in this passage, Herod is mentioned twice, and he's referred to as King Herod both times. But after the Magi meet the King of Kings, he's just Herod. And what's interesting is Herod will be mentioned several more times in the Gospel of Matthew, and he will always be just Herod from here on out. Because when you encounter and worship the real king, all fake kings get exposed. And I don't know what you're dealing with right now. I don't know what powers exist in your life that are calling for your allegiance right now. I don't know what's distracting you. I don't know what's keeping you down. I don't know what's discouraging you right now. But I know one thing. When you keep your eyes on the true king, the king of kings, the king sent from heaven, you will have a new perspective and you will realize that all these other powers that exist in the world are illegitimate powers. And Jesus is the start of God's counteroffensive to get rid of all of these illegitimate powers so that one day the entire world will know who truly reigns. You see, Christmas reminds us that the Herods of this world are only posing as kings. Satan may claim to be the prince of this world, but he is a phony. The Christmas story reminds us that one day every knee will bow before Jesus, and on that day we will celebrate and be full of joy because we will have citizenship in His kingdom. Because what started in a manger will end with Jesus on the throne. And when you know that, it will bring you joy. Even when Satan and all the other illegitimate powers out there are doing their thing. And when you have this joy of heaven living within you, it will give you leverage over what's going on around you. If you were here early, there may have been some people outside passing out these little wooden tokens. The reason why we were passing them out, and some of you got them, is because I want this to be a reminder of the joy that we have because of Jesus. I sat down with my family this week, and I said, why don't you write on one of these tokens what we have because Jesus was born? We talked about the Christmas story, and My son Alex put on his token, the joy of heaven. I said that a lot. It clicked, and so he wrote it down. And it looks very Christmassy, doesn't it, with all the Christmas colors there. Addie drew that. And I wasn't exactly sure what that was. Kind of looks like something from the Game of Thrones. I'm not sure. But uh, I asked her, I was like, "Uh, what is that? And she said, Daddy, it's a crown. And I'm like, that is the prettiest crown I've ever seen. You're right. That is a crown. If you say it is, it is. Here's the thing, I've got that token with me that they drew on. And I'm going to carry this around with me 
the next few days and even after the Christmas holiday. Because I think I need a reminder that things are not always as they seem. And when your Christmas plans don't go as planned, or when you have to go back to work after Christmas, and you have to deal with that coworker that's hard to deal with, <laughs> when you deal with all the stresses of this world, just remember, things are not always as they seem. Don't miss what Jesus came to give us. He's rewriting the history of the world. And he wants you to be part of his story, his story of good news, of great joy. See, Herod, he missed Jesus. He was so caught up in his own pride and agenda that he missed Jesus. The religious leaders in Jerusalem, they missed Jesus as well. They knew where Jesus was supposed to be born. They are the ones who looked it up in the Old Testament Scripture. And yet, they didn't make the five-mile journey with the wise men to go see if the Messiah had really been born. Maybe they were too busy. Maybe they were distracted. Maybe they were having family over for the holidays. I don't know. But they didn't make the trip. They missed him. But the Magi traveled all that way because they knew that he could offer them something that this world couldn't. And tonight, I want to challenge you, don't miss him. Because if you miss him, then you miss the joy of heaven. Jesus is called the light of the world. It's interesting, there's a house in my neighborhood that decorates their home with lights every single year. And they really go all out. I mean, you can drive up and tune into a radio station and their lights dance with music and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they go all out. Every single night, there's a line of cars, you know, this time of year, trying to get a glimpse of this house. And one year, the neighbors that were right beside them, they didn't put a single light on their house, but they put this sign on their garage. Ditto. <laughs> I love that. But as funny as that is, I'm afraid this is how many people celebrate Christmas. See, Jesus came to be the light of the world. And when you let him light up your life, you experience the joy of heaven. Not just when things are going well, but also during the difficult days. And so many people, they see other people this time of year have something that they don't have, but yet they still sit on the sidelines and they miss the light that could shine into their darkness. We don't want to miss him and I don't want you to miss him. So tonight, we're going to light candles together. And this room is kind of dark, and when we all have candles that are lit, it's going to light up this room. And honestly, I think that's what happens when we live with the joy of heaven. When we day in and day out, even on our worst days, live with inner peace, inner satisfaction, inner joy. Not fleeting happiness, but contentment that this world can't steal from us. People notice and when we express the joy of heaven in our daily lives, it lights up the world. This Christmas, I hope that you let Jesus light up your life. Embrace him. Because I don't know what you asked for this Christmas, but I sure know what he wants to give you. And it's joy, unspeakable joy. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to celebrate the birth of your son. And we just pray that we will be a people who embrace him. And as we embrace him, we overflow with joy. And as we live with the joy of heaven in our lives, we will light up the world. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. From my home to yours, Merry Christmas.